I came across a, a quote from you from, oh, four years ago, uh, more than that, in which you said that uh, you prayed that uh, you dropped dead before you were 80 because you probably could not work at full schedule. <laughs> Thank God your prayers are not answered. But now that you're 84, are you going to try for 90? No. No, please God, I don't want to live that long. The reason I prayed to die at 80 was because I felt that my usefulness would be finished. But it isn't. And so I'm happy to work and I'm happy to go to heaven and when I get there I'll ask the good Lord to send me back after a few days of happiness there to come down and do some more work here. What is it you're doing now? I'm writing my own autobiography. It is called Clay. That is to say, the clay refers to me. The treasure in clay is the vocation. Mm -hmm. Bishop Sheen, do you foresee in the distant future any change in the, in the church's stand, the Catholic church's stand, and certain issues today which have been quite controversial? Certainly abortion has been. Do you foresee ever any change in that? No. Not at all? No, because we have no power over the divine law. Furthermore, suppose we did. Suppose John Paul II tomorrow said, all right, bring out your contraceptives. Pull out your scalpels. Unplug the children from their wombs. Marry as you please. Unmarry as you please. Fornicate as you please. What would be the difference between the church and the world? But meanwhile, Bishop Sheen, you do have many women who, uh, who have had abortions, who go to church. Yes, there's no reason why they shouldn't go to church and pray the good Lord will forgive them. That's good. I'm glad they do. <laughs> I mean, better that if they're going to have an abortion that they still go to church yes. than not at all. Yes, exactly. How do you see children and being able to teach human values to children? Uh, how do you teach them right from wrong? when they see otherwise around them? First of all, children have within themselves are an in, a built-in comprehension of right and wrong. In the beginning of their lives, everything is baby, baby hurt. After a while, they distinguish between the fire and themselves. And it isn't wrong until they distinguish between things that the parents approve and things that they do not. This idea of saying, leave the children be free, let them grow up to do whatever they want, then they will decide. Why do we have pot training? When we talk about the family, Bishop Sheen, are, are you distressed by the fact that, that uh, in many cases you have men and women living together without marriage? Yes, and principally because it is the destruction of love. Unfortunately, in English, we have only one word for love. So we have to say, I love pickles, I love the New York Mets, I love God. The Greeks had three words for it. And two of them that were important were eros, which was <clears throat> friendship love, when Freud made the erotic, or sex, then there's the agape, sacrificial love. Now, when you're speaking of the family and these new customs that have sprung up, we have only eros, the erotic love. We have a love in which the ego projects itself into another and says, I love you, when all that is loved is the pleasure that is found in the other person. And this kind of love is the destruction of the family and the destruction of the human person. As a matter of fact, I believe one of the reasons why we have so much neurosis and psychosis is this tremendous affirmation of the self. I, I got to do my thing. I have to have my pleasure. You bend yourself to my will. When real love does not mean to have and to own and to possess, it means to be had, to be owned, to be possessed. The ancients were right in giving Cupid an arrow, something that wounds, 
something that sacrifices itself for another. Do these people ever show love, for example, for the, their neighbor and for the downtrodden? No. It is generally for the satisfaction of self. So this kind of uh, life is producing neurotics and psychotics in our civilization. You mean more so than ever? More so than ever, yes. People today are without goals and without purposes. That is one of the reasons why our civilization is erotic. We try to make the intensity of a sex experience atone for a want of a purpose in life. Hmm. Just as when we're lost in an automobile, we drive faster. Take your average woman in mid-30s, say, who is a mother, a wife. She's bored, she's restless. You say that she is likely or would regard a sexual experience as um, something that might fulfill her? Uh, one, I would say nothing about that particular woman. But she has, she has something that can give her a passion, that's the raising of children. Believe me, she's got some, some arrows that she has to shoot. And she'll be held responsible whether or not those arrows ever hit the mark. Well, how do, what can you say to that woman, though, to make her aware of this, what you're saying about raising those children? Because the tendency is to say, oh, I can't wait to get out of the house, away from children. I'm so tired of, of children underfoot. All right. What do you say to anybody, not just that woman? What do you yeah. say to anybody? Yeah. What do you want? Why are you bored? You want three things. If you could take your heart out as a kind of crucible, and to still out of it, its inmost cravings, what would they be? One, you want life. Not for five more minutes. Not for five more years. What else do you want? You want truth. Not just what you read in the paper. Truth of geography, literature, science, everything. We hate to have secrets kept from us. Thirdly, what do you want? Love. And a love without satiety. A love without fed-upness. A love that is constant. That's what you want. Now, do you find them here? Do you find life here? No. Why? Uh, because life is mingled with a shadow death. We get old. Truth? That's mingled with a shadow error. Love, that is mingled with the shadow hate and satiety. So here we are in this rat race, something we want, something we, we can't find. What's the answer? Are we to say life is a mockery? Or are we, are we to say, as we might in this room, what's the source of light? Not under the chair, there's light is mingled with shadow. Not behind the bookcases, there light is mingled with darkness. We would say as logical beings, well, source of light, I have to go out to something that's pure light. So, if you want a life and a truth and a love, a life that, a life that is not mingled with the shadow death, and a truth that is not mingled with the shadow error, and a love that is not mingled with the shadow hate, you want pure life, pure truth, pure love. That's what you want. That's only a definition of God. And when you want that, you have everything, and then everything fits in place. So what you're saying is that we've been too permissive. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Hoping that the children will like us, and they don't. That's the penalty of being permissive. There is nothing that helps develop character of a child as much as a pat on the back, provided it is given hard enough, low enough, and often enough. Is this how you were raised? I had one spanking. I can, only one in my life. We had a horse when I was a boy, Morgan. We kept in a barn back of our home in Peoria. And uh, I was to feed the horse every noon. And I would go out and cut off some of the hay that was in a bale and feed it down the chute to Morgan. And my father came home this noon and said, did you feed the horse? And I said, yes. He said, I was just out there. There wasn't any hay in the bin. And I said, well, I fed the horse. And uh, evidently Morgan was hungry that day and ate it all. 
So he gave me a spanking for lying. My mother said to my father, no, he fed the horse. I saw him. Well, my father said, well, that spanking will do for the next time. But I never received another. 